Last Monday, I sat down at my computer here up in my office, and I got ready to write. The first thing I typed was, good morning, sweetheart. Seems odd, I know, but let me tell you the whole story. Before Tammy and I were even married, she would uh, ask me to drive her down. We'd see her grandparents. We'd go visit her grandparents. They lived in Azalea. Of course, you know, right in between Roseburg and Grants Pass off I-5. Azalea, yeah, okay, okay, you're with me now. But anyway, we would go over see Grandpa Bill and Grandma Jerry, and, and usually by the time we'd wake up and walk in the kitchen, Grandpa Bill would say, Good morning, sweetheart. Just like that. Now, back then, I was touchdown Tommy. I was a tough kid. I didn't like being called sweetheart. But anyway, every morning when we got married, had kids, we'd continue to go down there every summer, every summer. Walk into the kitchen there, Grandpa Bill. Good morning, sweetheart. So I'd come home for a couple months. I'd be making fun of Grandpa Bill. My kids would come in the kitchen. I'd tell them, good morning, sweetheart. We'd all laugh. But before long, you know what happened? I, at some point, I stopped making fun of Grandpa Bill, and I just started telling my family and my girls when they'd come to the breakfast table, good morning, sweetheart. It just became who I was. So for those of you watching online, I want to say to you this morning, good morning, sweetheart. And those in-house, I want to say to you, Good morning, sweet. Go ahead and tell the person sitting next to you, good morning, sweetheart. Just tell them that. Just in memory of Grandpa Bill, God rest his soul. Well, we've been talking about thou shall not be a jerk. And as Christ followers, and I would imagine there may be some in the room, you're not a Christ follower, or at least watching online, you would say, I'm not a Christ follower. And, and um, that's okay. I, I understand that. We're glad you're listening. And some of the principles that we're going to learn today that would be good for you to apply to your life, I think you'd have a better life if you did. But we've been learning how not to be a jerk because as Christ followers, we're instructed by him to love people and not to treat people poorly. Zach, Pastor Zach got up here and he was preaching one Sunday about love with tears. That means that we show people love and and give them truth and tears truth and humility we might say does anybody do you know somebody humble don't raise your hand might might come back to bite you later why didn't you raise your hand i'm humble um, but you know somebody humble they're just it's attractive it's so attractive when somebody acts humbly last week we read micah 6 8 let me see. This is a test. A week later, can we remember? There were three elements to Micah 6, 8. Do justice. Good. Uh, let me see. The other one was love. Love mercy. Yes. And the third one was walk humbly before God. Yes. And so we were talking about we're not going to be jerks and we're going to help the less fortunate. One thing I forgot to say last week, people that are just my heroes are people that foster kids and end up adopting kids. I just think that is amazing. I should have listed that as helping the, the quartet of the vulnerable. We talked about that, the, those uh, vulnerable, the kids are vulnerable. So we strive for unity in, in um, I keep running into this verse, Hebrews 12, 14, probably because I have a mark right there in my Bible, but anyway, I keep running into this verse, and that is pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. So that, sa that says right here what this series has been about, thou shall not be a, bur a, a jerk, is that in the conflicts of this polarized society in which we live, seek peace, but not at the expense of sacrificing holiness. So last, it was Sunday. I bet, I bet Rick can relate to this. Steve, you used to be a youth pastor. You could probably relate to this. You, you preach, and then about the time you're walking off the stage, you're like, oh no, what am I going to say next week? You, you ever do that? Yeah? 
Yeah, me too. That's what I did last week. I'm like, what am I going to say next week? And I felt like the Holy Spirit dropped a verse inside of me. The verse is, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. As he thinks. Our artists at the table, you could do one of those little thought bubbles, draw a face, maybe a thought bubble. Above, as a man thinks in his heart, or as a woman thinks in her heart, so is she. Which I began to think about that passage of scripture last Sunday afternoon sometimes, and, and how we've been, I've, I've been up here, and, I, and I've been telling you that act right. You know, treat people nice and strive for unity. And, and, and I've been talking about the actions, but, but uh, seldom does that really work in the long run to just change the action. For example, have you ever gone on a diet? How long has that lasted? Right? When we try to change our actions, it, it doesn't last in the long run Somewhere I ran across this, that programming leads to thoughts, thoughts lead to feelings, feelings lead to actions, and actions lead to results. So if we're going to make lasting change, if we're truly not going to be jerks, then we have to go through a, a new program and get a new programming. So then I started thinking, well, what, what, are, some, what are some core beliefs that we, should, that we should have in our programming if we're going to live life in the way that Jesus wants us to live our life and not be jerks. And so today, that's what I want to do. I want to give us four core beliefs on, and that we're just going to have to believe this if we're going to love people and strive for peace with holiness and, and help the widows, orphans, immigrants, and the poor. The first one that I thought of is that every human is created in God's image. So in Genesis 1.27, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. I was in a meeting last week. I got beat by two strokes. I don't want to talk about that part, though. The part I want to talk about, when I was loading my clubs up, the guy stopped by my car, and he, and he said, I've been... Getting the, the, the Lord's place something on my heart. Do you want to hear it? I was like, yeah, I want to hear it, of course. And he said, you know, God created us in his own image. And I said, yeah, yeah, I know. I read that too. And then, and then he said, but this is what I've been pondering. What was God imagining when he created me? I thought, man, that's, that's pretty good. What was, God what was God imagining when he created me? Am I living my life right now is how close is that to what God created me for, what he was imagining. So if I believe that God created me, us, mankind, in his image, then at my core, when I just get rid of all the peripheral, at my core, then I'm created in God's image. Conversely, if I believe in evolution, then at my core, then... I, would be animal instinct type thing. So I, I would encourage you to make sure in your programming, way down deep inside of you, that you believe you're created in God's image. Go ahead and tell the person sitting next to you, you are created in God's image. Now the next core programming belief I came up with Actually, I asked Pastor Andrew. He came up with it. I think this one really should be first. And I'll, and I'll tell you why later. But here it is. Jesus rose from the dead. The, uh, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, he said, if Christ, is not risen, then, if Christ is not risen, then Pastor Tom's preaching is empty. And your faith also is empty. Jesus didn't, I mean, Christianity really hinges on Christ raising from the dead. That's why I say this must, this could be the even more important that we are created in God's image because we've got to get this straight right here, that Christ rose from the dead. And, and if you're wrestling with that, you're not sure if that happened or not, I would encourage you to, 
to seek out Pastor Andrew, and he will direct you to some fantastic material that you can study that will help you understand why we believe that Christ rose from the dead. This, this is a major decision right here for us to believe in the resurrection of Jesus, because when we believe in the resurrection of Jesus, there's just a whole bunch of dominoes that begin to fall. For example, Jesus is God, and you're not. And Jesus is God, and I'm not. And also that that Jesus saves us. We don't save ourselves. We don't work. We don't have to work to save ourselves because he's, he saves us. You can see last week's sermon if you're wondering about that. Also, at salvation, there's a whole bunch of things that happen, and this, these are just some that are listed in Ephesians chapter 1, and that is that uh, Jesus, in Jesus we are righteous, we are chosen, we are holy, we are blameless, we are loved, we are adopted sons and daughters, we are accepted, beloved, redeemed, forgiven, blessed with every spiritual blessing from above. Everybody say hallelujah. Okay. Here's another, after we uh, figure out that Jesus rose from the dead, here is something else that we need to believe at our core beliefs, and that is that the Bible is God's word. Now, our artists at the table, if you want to, you can draw the Bible and just write right on the front of it, the Holy Bible. You can call it the Holy Bible, or you could call it the owner's manual for living a great life here on earth. Or you could call it the good book. Or you could call it the inerrant, infallible word of God. But no matter what you call it, 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. So let me give you, I just want to give you one more core belief, and I'm sure, I hope, that you could think of more. As a matter of fact, I made it one of your life group questions this week. In life group, you can just tell everybody that Pastor Tom forgot this core belief that we should have, and uh, you can uh, let your life group know what exactly I missed on my list, because I'm sure there are more, but these are four that I came up with that I think if we believe these four, it will carry us a long way. The last one is I'm an alien. First Peter 2.11 says, Beloved, I, be- I beg you but as sojourners and pilgrims. That word, the Greek word that's translated to us as sojourners can also be translated as aliens. And that's what we are as Christians. We are, not, we are not supposed to really feel comfortable on this earth. Now, we try to make it comfortable, and we try to get a whole bunch of stuff, possessions and prominence and, and position and prestige. We try to do that so we feel right at home here on this earth. But I'm here to tell you this is not what we're created for. We're created in God's image God created us, and we're, not gonna, we're just not going to feel at home until we live totally in the kingdom of God. And so our goal right now is to continue to read the word of God, continue to allow it to, to change our minds so that we will be kingdom-minded, and, and that's about as close as we're going to get until we spend eternity with God. So look at the person next to you and say, you're an alien. Now, not the kind of E.T. alien. That's not what I'm talking about, that kind of alien. I'm talking about more like uh, somebody that's from another country that lives in this country type of alien. So how do we reprogram our minds then? How do, what, what if we don't, what if there's some of those four core beliefs that I gave you that, that you, you're like, yeah, I really don't have that in my thinking. I want to get that in there. And this is tough because brain brain doctors or neuroscientists, they say that 80, 90, even I've read 90% of our brain, of the way we think is formed by the time we're three, four, five years old. So, man, most of us in this room, we're set. Many of us in this room are on autopilot, as a matter of fact. 
I was talking, uh, I was talking with a kid the other day, and and uh, they were telling me how their parents fight a lot, which I'm sure their parents would be so excited that they told me that. But anyway, I, I, it made me think about Tammy and I. We used to fight a lot more when we were younger, so I was processing that. How come we fought so much early on in our marriage? And And what I came up with, I had 20 years of male experience all programmed into me. And then I married her and she had 18 years of female programming inside of her. And then we tried to come together and live together. And that was friction began to happen. It's like oil and vinegar. I was listening to a teaching last, uh, last week by Tony Evans. And he was talking about mayonnaise. I love me some mayonnaise, he said. I love mayonnaise on sandwich. I love mayonnaise on anything. And he was saying that there's two elements in mayonnaise, is vinegar and oil. And you can stir that up and stir that up and stir that up, but you stop stirring and they separate. He likened that to marriage. And he said, but when it comes to mayonnaise, in comes the emulsifier. Is, any, is there any cooks in here that know what the emulsifier that grabs the oil and grabs the vinegar and holds them together? Any cooks in here know what that is in mayonnaise? Eggs. <laughs> I think your auntie whispered that to you for some reason. But maybe you make mayonnaise. I don't know. Yeah, it's eggs. For some reason, the, ra the egg's okay with oil and the egg's okay with vinegar. Grabs them and holds them together. Now, I want you to think, those of you that have been married, you've been married for a long, a while, and maybe you fight less than you used to fight. I want you to think about that for a second. What, what is it that, what's the emulsifier in your marriage that has helped you Stick together. What is it in your marriage? And I'm not going to let you just get away with Jesus. Okay? I want you to be a little bit more specific than Jesus. I want to help some of the young marriages that are in the room. Did anything come to anybody's mind? Love and respect. Yes, the, the gal needs love and the man needs respect. We Actually, we both need both, but a little bit more of that. Good, good. Great revelation. Somebody else want to share? No, they can't top that, I guess. The teeth. <laughs> the teeth. <laughs> That's my good friend, Rick. <laughs> Excuse me? Hard times actually helped you stick together in other times. Yeah, that's true. Ooh, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, goodness, and so on and so forth. Anybody else? Children. Yes, a common enemy. No, I, I, I'm sorry. I should have never said that. Lord, forgive me about the common enemy joke, and God bless the orphans at O Sunday Day. Sure, children. Okay, I'm going to move on. Love. Humility, yes. Yes, I, I, I wrote down a couple. Let's see. Uh, I wrote down death. Yeah, the two become one. Turns out you have to die before you can come one. That was something that I learned. Humility, you guys got that. I learned to serve. And then trust, forgiveness, yeah, and respect, good. So what happened to me, maybe some of you can relate to this. You've got 20, 25, 30 years of male experience, and you bring that in to your marital relationship. And then one day you're reading the Bible, and 1 Peter 3, 7 says, Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wife, and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as an heir with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. And in that moment, you have what 
brain doctors call cognitive dissonance. You have two conflicting opinions or two conflicting uh, beliefs or two conflicting thoughts or two conflicting attitudes in the brain at the same time because you're like, oh, wait a second, my favorite, my life verse was wives submit to your husband. And now I read this verse that's actually written toward to a husband and I realize that that verse written to the wife wasn't even for me to read, that this one is supposed to be for me because I'm the husband and I'm supposed to be nice to her and, and treat her as, as the, the way I would want to be treated. And, and, if, and if I don't, my my prayers aren't going to be answered. And you're like, oops. And in that moment, you can change your programming if you throw out the old belief and bring in God's word belief. Same thing for you wives. You might be reading 1 Corinthians 7, 3 one day, and it says, let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. And in that moment, you're like, oh my word, you have cognitive dissonance. You're like, oh my word, I'm, I'm supposed to be giving my husband his due, keeping this PJ, PG8, PG7, we have little ears in the room, I'm supposed to be giving my husband his due, and I've been giving him a big old bag of doo-doo. <laughs> and in that moment, ladies, you have an opportunity to change your programming. So, married couples, I'd encourage you to go home and read 1 Corinthians chapter 7 through about verse 5 or 6 in there. It oh, may be good for you. So, the brain doctors say it is possible to change our programming, and we can do that one of two ways. You know, earlier I said programming leads to thoughts, lead to feelings, lead to action, leads to results. Basically, the two ways that we can change the programming, the first one is repetition. And that would be why we pastors and youth pastors and life group leaders and Sunday school teachers and, uh, you know, people, that's why we encourage you, read your Bible all the time. Read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible, because through repetition, you know, you, you run into verses like Philippians 2, 3 that says, let nothing be done out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. And so you're like, oh, wait a second. I thought the world revolved around me. But you keep running into verses like this that say to prefer others better than yourselves. And now you have an opportunity through repetition, reading that over and over and over in the Bible, to, to get rid of that old programming and put in the new programming. So that's one of the ways that we can change our programming. And the second one is emotionally charged input. If you change lanes just one time without change, checking your blind spot and you get in a car crash, you will check the blind spot the rest of your driving life. <laughs> There's somebody that changed lanes without looking in their blind spot. Now, of course, it's easier to just do that from the beginning. But that's emotionally charged to input. So your spouse leaves you one day and says, you're a real jerk, right? And maybe he or she have been saying that for years and you didn't hear it. But all of a sudden on this particular day that they leave, you will hear it. And you'll be in a situation where you can make an adjustment. Or if the doctor tells you, hey, if you keep living the way that you're living right now, you're going to be dead in six months. It's an emotionally charged input, and you're like, oh, okay, how, what is the lifestyle that I am supposed to change? How is it that I'm supposed to live? Or uh, often when somebody dies, then uh, that, that is an emotional time, and it's a time for reflection and a time for change. Last week, from, we had four grandkids staying with us from Sunday, and they left on Thursday. Let me tell you. Kids are for the young. But one of the days, I came home from work on Monday, and the kids were playing out front in the yard, and my driveway was full of sidewalk chalk pictures and stuff. And I noticed there were two columns. So I looked at the top of this one column, and it said, Marley loves. Now, Marley's my oldest granddaughter. She's 11. And Marley loves. And I could... 
just by looking at the list, I, I saw that she forgot to put Papa and Grammy Tammy on there, so I added that because I knew it was an oversight on her part. And so then I looked at the Marley Hates column, and, and there was just one thing listed. It said, Marley Hates School. So that earned her a lecture from Big Papa. And I said, hey, Marley, come here. I said, you really shouldn't. You really shouldn't say that you hate school. You shouldn't write it down. I said, honey, because your words are so powerful. Your words are so powerful that you're actually creating the world that you're living in right now with your words, the words that you speak. And I said, it would be much better for you to say, I love learning or, or I love being smart so much better for you to, to use language like that because now you're going to form the type of world where you're going to continue to learn. You're going to continue to be, uh, you're going to continue to get smarter all the time because things actually become like the words that we're speaking. Like every morning I tell my wife, good morning, sweetheart. Because I said those, I just said those words over and over and over, and then at some point that became me. Well, my question for you is, what world are you creating with your words? Well, we never have enough money in this house. Is that does that sound more like what you say in your house, or does it sound more like you to say, "My God shall supply all of my needs according to His riches and glory." I don't, I, don't, I don't have enough energy to clean this house. I don't have enough energy to mow the lawn. I don't have enough energy to do the dishes. I don't have enough energy to clean the garage. Or do we say stuff like, I can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. I just, you just, you, you think about yourself right now. Are the, the, do most of the words that are coming out of your mouth, are they, are they scripture-based? Can we, can we look at the Bible and find that they're in the Bible? Or are most of what you're saying in your life, are they contrary to the word of God? Because the world that you have right now is, is the world that you are creating. I mean, most of us, some of your kids... It's, it's your parents' fault. You can still blame them. But for most of us in this room, the world that we are living right now is the world that we've been thinking and the world that we've been speaking over. So my question for you is, what, what world have you created with your repetitious words? Because you've actually spoken your life into existence. Are you going the words that you're speaking, are they on the, do they shade the positive side or do they shade the negative side? I mean, are you, are you speaking godly, you know, godly principles or are you a jerk face? Let me, let me pray. Lord Jesus, I, I know you created the world with your words. You spoke things into existence and here we are created in your image and we are actually creating the world that we're living in by the words that we're speaking so God I, I, I pray that we will daily at least weekly we will say things like I'm created in God's image and that Jesus rose from the dead and one day I will rise from the dead or, or I can live a Jesus resurrection life right now on earth. And that when we feel uncomfortable in this world, that's okay because we're aliens. We're, we're not home yet. We're not looking on your face yet. Lord, I pray for any that are inside this building right now or any that are online that are trying to decide if they want to follow Jesus and his teachings or if they want to continue to do things their own way or the ways of this world. Lord, I pray that 
you continue to pursue them by your Holy Spirit. And I pray that it will be real evident to them the decision that they are to make to follow you. Lord, I pray that they just will push all in and they'll serve you with all their heart and all their mind and all their soul. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me, please. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you and the Lord will make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and he'll lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you shalom, shalom. Goodbye, sweetheart. <laughs>